Acts. And if you've been here in the past few Wednesdays, we've been uh, looking at different chapters each Wednesday. And uh, we've got where uh, Amos was called and he gave a message. Uh, it wasn't an easy message. He had to give a message to uh, his nation as well as uh, Judah and Israel were kind of separate. And he was from Judah and he had to give a, a message to Israel and Judah. Uh, we know that his message was uh, God's impending judgment. And we looked at a calling that Israel had. We looked at a calling that uh, Amos had in his life. Uh, we looked uh, last week in chapter 4 and, and how they didn't accept the correction and uh, how they questioned his authority. And uh, we, ta- we talked about the lifestyle they were living and, and uh, uh, some specific things that God addressed with their sin. Now we're going to look in chapter 5 and he starts off here again with, Hear this word. So Amos was trying to get their attention, saying, I have a word from God. You need to listen up. And uh, he says, I take up against you a lamentation of O house of Israel. Now, this lamentation is a, is a wail. Um, we don't... Some, some of you have probably been to a funeral where... And it's it just... It really... Um, it, sometimes it'll just make you uh, cry or in, in, in sympathy when somebody just moans at a funeral or, or just loses it and just, just wails out in anguish. Uh, this is the kind of uh, lamentation that, that's ta- that's talking about here. And it's often associated with a funeral. Matter of fact, they had, um, in the Jewish time, they had professional uh, wailers, basically. So if you uh, had a funeral and you could actually hire some people, they'd come to your funeral and moan and wail over you. Uh, it sounds funny uh, now, but 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 they that's they did. They were they were professional uh, funeral um, wailers. Okay, but this was often associated with a funeral, and it was often a lot of times where uh, uh, someone would just uh, be like pounding their chest or every way they could express a a total distress in their in their moan or in their in their uh, uh, words. And this is where Amos was coming from, but it wasn't something that was fake. It wasn't something that Amos was doing out of show. This was a general lament for his nation. It was a general uh, uh, concern and a, and a general burden that he was carrying for uh, the, the nation of Israel here. And uh, they were dead in their sins. So many people were wondering, well, why, why is he uh, acting like it's a funeral? Uh, but they were dead in their sins, and there was a coming judgment. You've heard the term dead man walking. You you uh, have someone on death row, and they're walking down, and uh, they're about to be executed. The, the term is often coined dead man walking uh, because it, there's just a matter of time before we know they're going to go either get the lethal injection or, or the um, electric chair. But, you know, if we think about it, we're all dead men walking. We're all dead men and women walking because we all have an appointment with death someday. Uh, and, and we have uh, uh, two choices. And we can be uh, uh, dead men walking physically, but we know that our home lies in heaven. Or we can be dead men walking and know that we have an eternal death and hell and punishment awaiting us. And the people must have wondered why Amos was, was speaking in this way, uh, like a funeral. Uh, but he was grieving the death of his nation. He was grieving the, the condition that the people around him were in. Uh, he was, he was uh, depressed about this. He was, he was grieved because he was given a burden. Uh, he was given a revelation from God of their sin and his sin, and also given the message that he had to deliver. And it grieved him to deliver this message of warning and judgment uh, that, that came. We also see in verses 2 and 3, it says, The, the virgin of Israel has fallen... She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. Uh, There is no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left. And that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. He was comparing the nation to a virgin daughter who had been ravaged and slain. Uh, that's that's a pretty graphic description. That's a pretty horrible uh, uh, thing to, to think of. But this is the picture that he was pointing out. But, you know, even worse than that, when you take someone and, and the picture of uh, someone who, who may be taken against their will, and uh, is speaking of, uh, you know, a young woman who is raped, there's nothing in that that's her fault, really. Uh, there's nothing in and of that that, you know, if, that, that she wanted or, or brought upon herself. So even worse is the picture in the Bible where it talks about playing the harlot. 
Because if, if a woman is, is taking in, in the symbolism, we know that a lot of times the, the, uh, the church is often referred to as the bride of Christ. Uh, we are betrothed to, uh, to Christ. Uh, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, which is a token uh, of, of His coming. It's, it's almost like our engagement ring. And we know that uh, in that time in the Jewish days, when in that uh, betrothment or in that engagement period, it was just like being married outside of the consummation. If, uh, if someone was caught cheating, uh, they could be stoned. That's why really, you know, Mary could have been stoned. They weren't married at the time, but they were engaged. And, and when she came up to be pregnant, pregnant, literally Joseph could have had her stoned. So the, the picture here is if someone was taken and raped, that would be a horrible situation, but that person really wouldn't have any control over that, that necessary of uh, defilement. But the picture of harlotry is something that's different. And many times that's what's pictured as the, the church uh, who is supposed to be the bride of Christ. Uh, um, even like the nation of Israel, which was God's chosen people, God was their leader, and he, he often said to them, you've played the harlot, you've went after other gods, uh, you've, you've essentially cheated on me. Uh, so even worse, the picture of someone taken and ravaged and slain is someone who willfully plays the part of the harlot. When we become Christians and, and accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we, we wear the, the signet, the Holy Spirit, and, and our life should be changed, when we go back to sin or we go back into some life, we're playing the harlot. We've willfully went back in bed with that old self. We've, we've willfully went and cheated and did the very thing that God despises. And, and even the, the harlotry would be worse than this picture of sin. Uh, our willingness is like the willingness of, of the, uh, the adulterer to cheat on the spouse. Uh, we don't call it cheating if someone gets raped, but when someone willfully cheats on their husband, then then that's adultery. And uh, this is the picture here. It says, uh, the city that goes out by a thousand, there's going to be a hundred left. This is a picture of God's judgment. And, and the ones that go out with a hundred, there's only ten left. God, through His faithfulness and promise, didn't totally destroy the nation of Israel. He He called a remnant, and a remnant remained. And even though they were scattered abroad, we know we saw prophecy fulfilled in 1947 when uh, Israel became a state. And uh, now we have a, uh, a, a, a country, a, a place, that, uh, the nation of Israel. And we see that remnant growing and coming back. And we see prophecy uh, unfolding in front of our eyes. But He's warning of a defeat here. Uh, let's look at verses 4 through 6. Amos continues to uh, warn. And uh, all these warnings were so they would come back to repentance. Uh, God wasn't wasting Amos' time. Uh, when he was warning of this uh, impending judgment, uh, there was a possibility for these people to repent. There was a possibility for them to turn from the ways that were displeasing to God. And God would have relented from his punishment. Remember Jonah and, and, and Nineveh? God told Jonah to go and preach. In 40 days, this place is going to be destroyed. Now, God said in 40 days it's going to be destroyed. But when Jonah went and preached, the nation repented. It said even the animals. They put sackcloth and ashes even on the animals in the nation. It was a, a, a national mourning and grieving. And it said that God relented. He repented of the judgment. So even though he had announced that 40 days this place would be destroyed... Because of their repentance, because of their change of heart, God relented of that judgment. You see, God is always willing to, to, to relent of the punishment, to, to give us if we would just repent and, and, and turn from, from the very ways that are displeasing to Him. So he, we see a call of repentance here. Look at verses 4 through 6. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to, to uh, Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel. Remember uh, last week we talked about what was going on in Bethel and Gilgal. We talked about the the uh, appearance of worship that was taking place. Remember how they were going down, and if it was a, a weekly feast that they were supposed to offer, no, they would they would do a, a a sacrifice twice a week. If it was if it was once a week, they were doubling, but it was it was out of show. It was to prove to others how religious they were. And that's why he says, "Do not seek Bethel. Do not do not enter Gilgal." He says, "But seek me." Seek God. Uh, he says, seek me and live. He said, seek the Lord. Uh, what does that mean, really? Seek the Lord. 
Uh, it means to, to change our thinking uh, and abandon the vain thoughts that direct a wayward life. Uh, to seek God is to turn from sin. To seek God is to want to live a godly life, a, a life that's pleasing to Him in everything that we do. Uh, not just what we do here in church, but, but everything. It, there was things in their life. You see, people that are disobedient, they think wrongly of God. They think wrongly of sin, and they think wrongly of their life. Uh, those that uh, are living in sin or have sins in their life, that they think wrongly of God. They think that God doesn't, he, he's, he's not going to punish them for their sins. He thinks there's no accountability for those sins. Uh, they, they think wrongly of sin to say, well, those are just little things. That's okay. It's not as bad as killing someone. It's not as bad as, as doing this. When it says in the Bible to turn from those sins, we should take what the Bible says. But see, those that are living in those things, they think wrongly of God. They think wrongly of sin, and they think wrongly of the life that they're living. Many people will look and uh, judge their life that they're living and base it off of comparing themselves to others. The Bible specifically warns against that. He says you don't go around comparing yourselves to others because guess what? They're comparing themselves to somebody else, and then they're comparing themselves to somebody else. I'm sure everybody in here could find somebody to compare themselves to to make them feel good about what the state that they're in now. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so. Well, at least I don't do this. When in actuality, we're supposed to put, compare ourselves to Christ. And it says, when, the, when, when we return to the Lord, we turn around to go in the right direction. That's repentance, to turn back to God. Not just to turn from something, but when we speak of repentance as a Christian, we're turning from sin and turning back to God. See, in the, in, the, in the original plan, we were to have fellowship with God. We were to commune with God and walk with Him. Sin separates us from that. So when we turn from sin, we turn back to God to go in the right direction. To seek the Lord means to despise sin. Turn from it. Seek fellowship with God. Why should we seek the Lord? Well, there's three good reasons why we should seek. There's probably more. I, you could probably come up with an uh, unlimited number for just for time's sake. Three. The Bible says, first off, seek me that we live. You seek the Lord that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Not just this physical life. We're talking about eternal life. Only through seeking Christ, turning from sin, professing Him as your Lord and Savior, can you live. So he says, seek the Lord that you may live. So the first and foremost is that we may have life. The second reason is, is there's no way other way to experience spiritual blessings. God is not going to bless you spiritually if you're not living for Him, if you're not obeying Him, if you're not following Him. He's not going to bless you spiritually. Now, you might be blessed financially. You might be blessed in other ways. And uh, the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. We see people all the time that, that uh, you know, uh, we see by all means. And even this nation, their attitude was, well, God is blessing us in prosperity, so He must be pleased with us. But as we read this and we study the message of Amos, it was exactly the opposite of that. Just because they were experienced financial prosperity and, and, and certain things, God was displeased with everything in their life. Uh, he, he was calling them to repent. But you see, you can't experience a personal spiritual blessing without turning and seeking to God. Blessings can't be purchased at a local dealer. You can't come to church and drop a tithe in the offering plate and purchase God's blessing. This is not a dealership of God's blessings, okay? That's not how it works. But people expect that sometimes. They expect, well, I went to church and I gave my tithe, so God, where's my blessing? Or, or I went to church and I did this, God, where's my blessing? It, it's not a dealership. It's not a, it's not a work or earn uh, the blessing. It's just serving God, seeking God, loving Him, uh, turning from sin. And then we have the promise of God's blessing. Uh, not that we, we do things uh, to earn that or to seek that or buy that. You see, we must personally meet with God, deal with our sin, seek His face, and allow Him to transform our heart. Give us the heart uh, that, that David cried out, search in me, create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord. Uh, uh, look at my heart. Uh, David was, was, was saying, Lord, I'm not claiming to have a perfect heart, but search my heart. Reveal things that are not pleasing to you, that I may have a clean heart. That should be our desire as a Christian, that God would, would search us. 
Show us things. Maybe we, we're not mature enough in the Bible to know some things that we're doing. We should pray daily that God would reveal things in our life. If there's something in your life that, that, uh, that for some reason you have uh, convinced yourself that it's okay or maybe, uh, not through, uh, reading His Word, but you should, you should pray to God. Lord, if there's anything in my life, if there's anything that's displeasing to you, no matter how much I might enjoy that, no matter how much I may have justified that, if there's something in my life that's displeasing to you, Lord, reveal that to me so that I can get rid of that, so that I can come to you with a clean heart, so that I can have a clean heart. You see, that's seeking God. See, why should we seek the Lord? The third reason is, is judgment is coming. Okay? It's coming. Whether Jesus comes back or we die in Christ, we still face a judgment. And then if we die without Christ, there's even a greater judgment. You see, in verse 6, it says, lest he break out like fire. That's the picture of God's judgment. See, it, his judgment hadn't broke out yet. He was still warning. He was still warning people. It's just like when it gets dry around here. They put the warning out, right? There's a fire risk. And they're warning you that the conditions are right for a fire. If somebody flicks a cigarette out, uh, a backfire spark, some lightning strike, something could get a fire going and we know it can be devastating. The picture here is like that. Amos is warning, the conditions are right for God's judgment. It's coming. He says, it's coming. That's why you need to get right. And so he, he's warning and, and, and we see that he's a consuming fire. The Bible says God is a consuming fire. But Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed once uh, for man to die and after this the judgment. That's everybody's appointment. The, the, the saints are going to be judged for what they did with their salvation. The lost are going to be judged and, and be held accountable and shown that uh, they were uh, a sin and they're deserving of hell and, and they'll be cast into hell. But for Israel, it was their judgment from their, for their nation, for their sins. See, for Israel to repent and return to God was, was a reasonable thing to do. Think about this. God cared enough about this nation to send Amos. To pluck him out of the, 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 the field or, or whatever he was doing as a farmer, uh, whether he was tending the, the, the goats or, or looking after the trees, he plucked him out and he said, I want you to deliver a message. Why? Because I love these people, they're my people, but they're in sin and I really want them to repent. But because I'm a just and holy God, if they don't repent, I'm going to have to send judgment. But I want you to do, I've done everything. I've sent drought, I've sent famine, I've sent some pestilences, and they still haven't returned to me. So now I'm going to send you to be my mouthpiece and to preach judgment is coming. Why? Because God wanted them to repent. But you see, after hearing that, it would have been a sensible thing for Israel to have repented. If nothing else, but out of the fear of the judgment, God still probably would have relented His judgment if they had just repented. You see, it was a reasonable thing to do. It would, have, it would have brought them life. It would have produced spiritual blessings. And it would have saved them from the impending judgment that God was prophesying. Those are the same very good reasons that God's people today should repent and return to Him and seek Him. Because we still face the very same things. If it was reasonable for Israel in that day, it's still just as reasonable for us. Seek Him. Why? So we may live. Why? So we can receive His blessings, living for Him. Why? Because judgment is coming. And you see, look at verses 7 through 15. You who turn justice to uh, wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. He made the uh, uh, Pleiades and Orion. He turned the shadow of earth into... Uh, he, he turned the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls uh, for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is His name. He rains ruin upon the strong so that the fury comes upon the uh, fortress. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time. For it is an evil time. Verse 14, Seek good and not evil that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. 
It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to a remnant of Joseph. You see, Amos appealed to two things that really anybody with uh, any type of common sense would, would, would enjoy. He appeals to, to justice and righteousness. Uh, when we talk about righteousness, we're talking about uh, the things that are right, the things that are, are just in this world. You see, God had to establish a human government because of sin. It was really never God's uh, 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 plan to, to have a, a, a king or, or a government system. We were going to have fellowship with God. God is the head. God is the ruler. And because of sin, we have division from Him. And because without a government, could you imagine this nation and this world without some type of uh, uh, rules or enforcement? Could you just imagine the state of North Carolina if there was no law, if there were no rules and regulations? How fast would people be going up here in 2427? Would people be breaking into your house? Uh, people would just be shooting each other if there was no consequences. You know, even in the Wild West, they, they sell things, but there was still a sheriff in town. There was still someone that kept uh, some type of order. Without order, you have chaos. And that's what sin brought on this earth was chaos. God established a human government because of that sin. Without it, it will fall apart. Uh, the strong would enslave the weak, the weak would exploit the, uh, the rich would exploit the poor, and uh, people would be killing one another. And, 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 and we see that he appeals to this righteousness and, and this justice. And he said that the very one that, that created the stars, that created this Orion, that turned the shadow of death into morning, makes the day dark as night, uh, the one that controls the, the waters from the sea uh, and pours them out on the earth, the one that controls the rain, the Lord is his name. But you see, they, they hated the one that brought the rebuke at the gate. It said they hated him because the thing that he spoke against was the things that they loved because they loved what they were doing more than they feared God. They didn't want to hear reproof and correction because they didn't like the way it sounded. It said they hate the one who rebukes. See, 10 through 13 says they rejected that warning. We just read that. They rejected his warning. You know what Proverbs says? Proverbs 13, 1 says, A wise man, a wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner, a mocker, a fool heareth not rebuke. So if someone doesn't listen to the rebuke, if they don't heed the rebuke, it says a wise man heeds rebuke, heeds correction. But it says a scorner, a mocker, heareth not rebuke. And then 14 through 15 that we read here, it says, They had been saying God was with them when he said, uh, As you have spoken. See, they had been saying all along that God was with them because they were prosperous. They were being blessed. So they thought God was with them because they enjoyed that prosperity. But how can you claim to love good and not hate evil? How can someone who, who uh, uh, loves children not hate child abuse? So we, we see a God that loves has to also be a God that hates. And we have things in the Bible that says God hates. Uh, he hates sin and it goes in, uh, in detail in some of the things that, that he hates. But how can we as Christians who claim to love good, to love righteousness, to love holiness, not hate evil? And if we hate the evil, if we hate the things of the world, how can we partake of the things of the world? If I hate something, I'm not going to want to do it. I hate raw tomatoes. I'm not going to eat them. Somebody might hold me down and shovel it in my mouth and, Lord willing, I don't get up from it. I just hate them. I'm not going to eat them. If I said I hated them and then you saw me eating a raw one, what would you think I was? A liar. But if I tell you that I hate them and you never see me eating one and you see me running from one and you see someone pilling one in my house and you see me go downstairs because I can't stand even the way they smell, what does that affirm to you? I hate tomatoes. If we hate sin, if we hate those things, why shouldn't people see that and be evident in our life? I'm going to run from it. I don't want to be around it. I don't like the smell of it. And you better not ever catch me doing it because then I'm going to be found out to be a liar. That's what he's saying. If we love good, we should hate the evil. He Psalms 97.10 says, You who love the Lord, hate even, hate evil. We're commanded. If we love the Lord, hate evil. Seeking the good means, uh, rejecting the evil, and not being ashamed to, to take our stand against what is wrong. The question still remains today. Even as it remain, uh, in Amos' time, it still stands today. Is there any hope for such a wicked society? When we look at this world and, and we see the things in, in the world as a whole, is there any hope still today for this society? The answer is yes. Uh, as long as God's grace is still abundant, 
as long as he's still holding back the wrath that's coming, there's still a, a, a chance. You see, a disaster was coming to Israel, uh, but who knows what would have happened if they had just repented. Even if a small remnant had just repented, had turned, had called upon God, had seeked Him, had, had sought Him, uh, they may have saved the wrath. It says that, that even uh, He would have been gracious to a, a remnant of, of, of Joseph. Ezekiel twenty two thirty says, So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. But Ezekiel says, I found no one. I found no one. Oh, don't let God look down here. And he says, I need someone to do this. He looks at this church and says, I need someone to do this. And he looks at this church and and he says, I I found no one. Oh, I need somebody to do this. I need somebody to teach Sunday school. I need some people to just show up for Sunday school. I need some people to help with Bible school. I need some people to do my work. And he looks and says, but I found no one. See, that's the attitude that we have sometimes today. God's looking for us to do certain things. And when he looks and looks and looks and he doesn't find anyone, he just allows somebody else to have that blessing. He finds somebody that will do that. And we rob ourselves of that blessing. Why? Because we're not seeking God. We're not being obedient to God. If he calls us to do something, we need to do it. Or we're going to rob ourselves of a blessing. Then verses 16 through 27. uh, I'm just going to recap these. I'm not going to read these for, for time's sake. 16 through 17, he's giving a description for the day of the Lord. It says that there'll be wailing in the streets. It says that there'll be wailing all throughout the towns uh, but because of the judgment that's coming. We know that in Revelation, when the final judgment comes and and God's pouring out the wrath upon the earth, that that, uh, there's a turmoil and there's bulls and the sun's made where it burns the people. And and instead of repenting, what does Revelation say? They they harden their hearts. They shook their fists at God and, 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 and they cursed God. Then we see through verses 18 and 19 the warning of spiritual ignorance. You see, I will read those two verses. 18 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It's sad to say that there's some professing Christians who's not ready to meet God, who says, Oh Lord, come on, but they're living in sin. And it says that that, that day is not really a day that they should desire. Because if you're not ready to meet God, you shouldn't be asking for that day. If you're not seeking God and living in a holy way, you shouldn't be saying, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Because it's not going to be a good day for you. It says for that, he says, For what good day is that the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Verse 19 says, It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. That's a man running from a lion and thinking he's getting away and runs into a grizzly bear. The end is going to be the same for that man. For those that are playing church, for those that are playing Christian, theirs is not to see Jesus come back. He says, make no bones about it. Your spiritual ignorance is not going to be an excuse. He says, because you're going to look for something in that day, but it's going to be darkness for you. It's going to be, it's going to be judgment for you. That's why he's warning, seek, seek his face. See, they were going through the motions. They had all these rituals and all these sacrifices and all these religious acts that they were doing. And they were looking for this day. And Amos is saying, no, no, because they thought it was going to be judgment on somebody else, but it was going to be judgment on them. How many people on that day will think that judgment is coming on the wicked and find it's coming on them? If we're not obeying God, if we're not living for him, if we're not seeking him. And then 21 through 27, we see the horror of false worship. You see, verse 22 said, God reject their false worship. He says, though you offer me burnt offerings in your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Why? Because they were doing them out of ritual. They were doing them out of some religious obligation. They weren't doing it out of a concern, a love, a repentant heart, a broken and contrite spirit. They weren't seeking God. They were just saying, here you go, Lord. This is how religious we are. As a matter of fact, we're not going to do it just once a week. We're going to do it twice a week so others can see how religious we are. What did God say? I'm not accepting that. I'm rejecting that. And then it says, but let justice run down like water in verse 24 and righteousness like a mighty stream. See, God rejoices in justice and righteousness. He's a just and holy God. His grace keeps his judgment from coming. But one day he will rejoice in that judgment. And it's something hard for you to get your mind around. But people are going to bring glory to God one way or the other. They're going to repent of their sin and come to Christ, and that brings glory to God. 
or when he cast them into hell, that's going to bring glory to him. And that's something hard to get your mind around. But one way or the other, because he's a just and holy God, he demands the obedience and he warns of the judgment. And if he says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. So one way or the other, you're going to bring glory to God. I just pray that it's living for him, that it's loving his son, worshiping him, seeking him, obeying him. And then we see the the final there in verse 27. Therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. You see God's rejection into captivity. Do you know, really, that's what we're talking about here in the big scheme of things? When you reject God, when you turn away from God, when lost people reject Him and His judgment comes, do you know He rejects them and casts them into captivity? They're going to be cast into hell where God is not there. And it says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth where the worm never dies. That's a picture here almost of this same captivity. So we see the parallels of this judgment that's coming. We see the parallels of Amos's warning. And we see it still to today's time. We can see us as individuals, as a nation, as a world, as the final judgment that's coming from God and then casting into captivity. But you know what? God is still looking for wall builders and for people willing to stand in the gap to plead with God, plead with Him to send revivals, not to send just a revival to us as individuals, but as a church, as a county, as a state, as a nation, as a world. God can still start a revival. But do you know who it starts with? It starts with us as individuals. God's still looking for people like that. Wall builders. People to stand in the gap. Stand in the gap that God's going to send judgment. Remember in the Old Testament where uh, God was uh, 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 displeased and he was, he was destroying the people with a plague and Aaron and Moses, they burnt some incense and they, they stood in the gap and the plague stopped. If it hadn't been for them, God's judgment would have wiped the people out. But they were willing to stand in the gap for those people. Are you willing to stand in the gap for those that are going to hell today? Are you willing to stand in the gap for those that are lost and dying today? What are you willing to do? God's still looking for some people, some wall builders. You see, the saints want God to judge the wicked, but the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. 1 Peter 4, 17 says that. Judgment has to start at the house of God. It will begin at the house of God. So the question today is, we have this, hear God's word. Are you listening? Seek the Lord. Are we praying? Seek the good. Do you hate that which is evil? And I don't mean dislike it. I mean hate it like I hate tomatoes. Or I don't even want to be around it. Or I don't want to smell it. Or I don't want to see it, touch it, much less taste it or partake of it. Do we hate the evil? If only a remnant will repent and turn to God, there's still hope that he will send the revival that we desperately need. Not only as individuals do we desperately need a revival. Not only as a church do we desperately need a revival. As a county, as a state, as a nation, and as a world, we desperately need revival. As bad as as bleak as it is, as knowing uh, that we know that God's judgment is coming, just like he pronounced God's judgment, he also pronounced a warning in hopes that they would repent. Same warnings out there today, in hopes that people would repent. Why? Because there can still be a revival. There can still be an outpouring as long as God's grace. But God's grace is going to come to end one day. And then what? The judgment. So seek the Lord. Love the Lord. Why? Because we want to live for Him. In order to live for Him. To receive the blessings. We seek Him. And we obey Him. So we see as uh, Amos is closed here. And, and the rest of the book of Amos, it goes more into the judgment pronounced. And I don't know if we'll get into that, but as we've seen this message in the book of Amos, we can, we can see Amos on the streets today, in the churches today, preaching this same message, maybe not to Judah and Israel, but to individuals, uh, to, 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 to not only our community, our nation, our, 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 whole, our whole world. We see this, this message of Amos still uh, pertains to us today. And uh, the same question is, is, what will you do with it? Will you listen? Will you seek him? Will you love him? Will you be uh, one that says, I'll stand in the gap? If God looks down and says, uh, uh, who's willing? Will he find none? Will he find some or will he find all? The goal is to find all. The goal is to, to have a church that's willing to do whatever it takes, whenever it takes, whatever God calls us to do. That's a church that's seeking God, loving him, and obeying him. Where does it start? 
It starts with the individual. It starts with a remnant. If we can get a remnant in the church, then the whole church. If we get the whole church, we might get a whole county. If we can get the whole county, we might get the whole state. It's kind of like this Bible thing in the school. If we can start off with a couple of schools, you get a remnant, God can work with a remnant. He can't work with none, but he can work with a few. And that's all he's looking for is a few. Will you be part of that few? Will you seek God? Will you, will you, will you, will you love him? Will you be obedient to him? Will you take the word that Amos has called and apply it and, and say, I'll be that one. I'll be that wall bearer. I'll be that one that wants to stand in the gap.